VIU Online presents GEC 101 English Composition, Week 3, Practical Lecture, Print, Electronic, and Other Media. This lecture is presented by Dr. Laura Hills, Professor of English at Virginia International University. We considered in our reading and theoretical lecture this week that it's dangerous and all too easy to fall into the habit of writing informally. But what does this mean practically? Well, first it means that you will need to review everything you write before submitting or sending it. In fact, if you're ever in the position of writing emails, a very good habit to be in is not to put the address in until you have written it and reviewed it once, so you don't have an accidental send. You don't use informal abbreviations, and here are some examples of abbreviations we might find in social media. LOL, COB, TMI, NP, TYT, UFN, there are many, many more. Now, I have seen students include these in academic papers. It happens. So, even though you may think you won't fall prey to this, be mindful that people do it every day. If you are very active in social media, this has become habitual with you, and you will need to be sure that it doesn't creep into your academic writing. Don't use emoticons. Again, we've seen these in academic papers. Writing informally doesn't mean anything goes. So if you are asked to write a blog post or a Facebook post, a tweet, a text message, or a profile on LinkedIn, you can be informal, but you can't be doing just anything you want. You still have to have good taste in what you're doing, especially if it's going to be used in an academic or business context. We also considered how important it is to plan online texts. But what does that mean practically? Well, first of all, it means you need to understand who your audience is, just as you would for a more formal academic paper. You need to know your purpose, again, just as you would in a paper. You need to know how much time you will have. Here's a good example. You're watching a lecture right now. It does not run eight hours. We know that there's a certain length of time after which you're going to have difficulty staying with a lecture. So we keep these pretty short in the scheme of the length of lectures for college classrooms. How long will you have? What is your rhetorical stance? Are you the expert? Are you a fan? Are you a novice? Who are you in writing this post or this, this website? You may use visuals and multimedia tools to support your writing. But what does that mean practically? Well, first of all, it means just as you would in an academic paper that you must observe copyright restrictions. You may cite sources but in a case such as video, for instance, citing is not enough. You may actually have to get written permission and pay fees to use certain materials that own, have copyrights, and you may not be granted those permissions. You need to include links that serve a rhetorical purpose and that are in an appropriate location. You need to think about interactive opportunities for your reader. And frankly, I think this is one of the most exciting aspects of electronic communication. You have opportunities, depending upon where you're writing, to conduct polls, to ask for comments, to have forums for discussions or have like buttons. One of the exciting aspects of GEC 101 is that you have weekly discussion forum questions and get to Talk with your classmates and your instructor about the material you're studying in this lecture and in your textbook, and that you're experiencing through the writing assignments. You are also encouraged to follow the rules of good netiquette. But what does that mean practically? Well, first of all, 
a good rule of netiquette is don't write in all caps because when you do, you are in essence shouting. You see how powerful that is? When you put something like that in writing, it's as though you are standing beside the person and yelling. It means that you, means that you need to be concise. This is not a medium that lends itself to long-windedness. You need to avoid flaming. If you are responding to something someone has said, don't jump to the worst possible conclusion and pour gasoline on the fire. Remain calm, even when you are passionate about your topic. You need to err on the side of formality. For example, if you are emailing someone and you don't know the person, use a formal form of address. Don't assume that you can call this person by his or her first name. Here's a tip. Review VIU Online's online study guide and participating in an online discussion forum for Netiquette tips. These are two resources that you can find on the Moodle page for this course under Course Orientation Materials. Writers today are encouraged to become familiar with the basic principles of good design. But what does that mean practically? First, it means that you need to differentiate parts of the page and text or visuals from the background. Now, this photograph shows a green frog in a green background. Notice, however, that the words on your screen are black against a white background. And do you know why that is? I made that selection very purposefully. It is the best contrast for readability. If I had red letters on a blue background, you would be tearing your hair out by now. So think about differentiating what's the text or visual from the background. Another design principle is to arrange the elements to line up with other elements for a clean look. You see these three illustrations? They're the same size. They're lined up together. That is a much more effective design than if I had them different sizes or not lining up. Let's look at another design principle. Guide readers by using color, layout, and other elements consistently. Think about design like perfume. A few nice smells, okay. But if you overpower people with too much perfume, they're not going to like it. And if you overpower them with too many different design elements, they're not going to like it either. Limit the number of typefaces. Notice I'm using a consistent way of making points A, B, C, D, and E. And that little arrow remains the same. If I had five different typefaces and five different symbols, it would not be effective in the design. Group related items together. See how I've done that on this screen? We have five pictures of dogs and three pictures of cats. This is a much more effective way to arrange things than if I had them all mixed together. When writing a video script, we are encouraged to write for the ears and eyes. But what does that mean practically? Well, we had a moment in our theoretical lecture this week where we spoke about onomatopoeia. That's a fancy word, isn't it? And you will recall it means that you use words that sound like what they are. And here are some examples. Click, boom, buzz, whip, zipper, cuckoo, wallop, thump. Now you can also use sentences or phrases that evoke sounds. Okay, they're not specific words, but we're going to conjure up sound images. Ready? Like the sound of rushing water. Can you hear it? Like the howling of the wind. Like a cricket chirping on a summer night. Like the crash of thunder. And to quote Sir Elton John, like the whistle of a train in a distance, writing for the eyes, like the gray of a cloudy day, 
like the hint, first hint of daylight on the horizon. You getting pictures? Like a billowy cloud, like a still pool of water, like the green of a new leaf in spring, like the shadow of a tall tree, like a friendly smile, like steam rising from a cup of hot coffee, like the graceful leap of a ballerina, like a spinning top, like a door you can't open, and like a candle in the wind. All beautiful images, right? We also learned this week that PowerPoint is probably the most misused presentation tool. But what does that mean practically? First, I can tell you that audiences can't read and listen to you at the same time. So if you're asking them to read a long, complicated paragraph on a screen and you're talking at the same time, they're not going to get it. Have you noticed in these recorded lectures that I am reading sometimes and that when I am speaking, I am speaking when there is just an image. That's very purposeful. Don't ask people to read and listen to you at the same time. It can't be done. You will bore your audience if you read your slides to them. Notice that I'm interspersing stories and explanations and examples along with this PowerPoint that is scripted. And you'll also notice something else, a decision that I made for you. I am reading parts of my presentation to help you with comprehension. This is especially helpful for audiences who may not speak English as their first language. Limit the amount of content you put on a single slide. How much is too much? I would personally stay with no more than three or four bullet points at a time that you're asking people to read and fewer than 50 words. Now you'll notice I have some slides like I had for the candle on the wind example and so forth where there were more than that, but we looked at them one at a time. Don't use your slides as a teleprompter know what comes next. It can be deadly to sit at a presentation where a slide comes up and it goes like this. Slide, talk, slide, talk, slide, talk. You do that for enough time and people will feel that they're being tortured. You want to introduce them to the next slide, at least occasionally. Keep text large enough to read and contrast it with the background. Look at Can You Read This? I have it twice on the screen. Once way too small and once way too faint. For maximum readability, there is no beating. Black on white, it works every time. Use visuals that reproduce well. I'll give you an example. Here's the VIU Online logo. Looks very nice there, right? Now watch what happens when I try to reproduce it in a larger form. Those aren't your eyes fooling you. It is blurry. So if I had put that up there, you'd say, what, what is going on? Either I need an eye exam or something's wrong with the PowerPoint. Use visuals that reproduce well. Finally, we learned that visuals can enhance and support our writing, but that they can't substitute for good writing. But what does that mean practically? Think of visuals as the strawberry and icing on this little cupcake. It is not the cake. The cake is your writing. The visuals make it better and maybe even everyone's favorite part and what they remember. But would you really want to eat icing and strawberries without the cake? No. Make the cake really good and then worry about what you do to dress it up. This concludes the practical lecture for week three.